Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, it's been already really fantastic with a really rich um, panel of speakers and just conversations already that I've had with people here at the Coffee Breaks has been really um, illuminating, so thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Um, so as Cameron said, my name is Kristen DeGraff. I'm a research fellow at the Vaccine Confidence Project at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, we're just around the corner, so we're neighbors to here, so it's really good to be here. Welcome, thank you. So the Vaccine Confidence Project is dedicated to monitoring public confidence in immunization programs worldwide. So here's some of our uh, lovely and growing team. I have missed out a few people because our team has expanded recently, um, but we cover a range of disciplines and regional expertise, and our work ranges across different vaccines, settings, geographic context, and ages. Our expert multidisciplinary team provides a mixed methods approach to investigating vaccine confidence to inform policies and interventions. So like Cameron said, I'm here to talk about a serious but also hopefully um, informative topic on vaccine hesitancy. So probably you are aware that vaccine hesitancy refers to a delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccines despite the availability of vaccination services. Um, despite scientific evidence supporting the safety and effectiveness of vaccines, we are witnessing growing distrust. So public distrust for vaccination programs and for the services that deliver them. Um, we like to talk about vaccine confidence rather than hesitancy all the time to kind of put a positive spin on it, and that concerns the belief that vaccination services, um, and by extension the providers and range of private and public sector entities behind it, serve the best health interests of the public. Um, and I couldn't be at Welcome without mentioning the Welcome Global Monitor. Um, it is the world's largest study into um, how people around the world think and feel about science and major health challenges. It includes findings about global attitudes to science and health based on a survey with over 140,000 people in more than 140 countries. So it's quite a broad um, survey. Um, and they asked a variety of questions. One of them was specific on vaccines. Um, it did show in a positive, positive note that more than three quarters of the world's population agree that vaccines are safe and effective. However, um, it did reveal that there are pockets of lower confidence in vaccines around the globe. This highlights the need to ensure that people have confidence in both the safety and effectiveness of vaccines. We do need to understand more about the complex reasons why people delay or refuse vaccines globally. So now I'm specifically, specifically going to talk about a project that I've been working on for the past eight months. It's called LNCT, which stands for the Learning Network for Countries in Transition. It's a country-driven network um, dedicated to peer learning to support countries as they transition away from Gavi, a vaccine alliance. Um, towards full and um, domestic funding of their vaccination programs. Um, so this included national immunization experts across uh, many countries, um, and it uses collaborative learning to support immunization program practice, practitioners and policymakers. The Vaccine Confidence Project was requested to lead a vaccine hesitancy work stream for LNCT in response to country requests for helping and supporting them in assessing and addressing their vaccine hesitancy challenges. Um, so LNCT broadly talks about financing, talks about transitioning away from um, support from Gavi to their national immunization programs and health strengthening, but specifically the Vaccine Confidence Project was dedicated to this peer learning around vaccine hesitancy. Um, and it included three different pieces to the work stream. So the research, um, we had 41 immunization experts from 12 countries that participated in the study to capture and frame experiences of vaccine hesitancy. Um, the countries that we interviewed included Armenia, Georgia, Ghana, Indonesia, Lao PDR, Moldova, Nigeria, Sao Tome, Sudan, Timor-Leste, Uzbekistan, and Vietnam. The purpose of our work was to facilitate facilitate knowledge exchange on best practices, shared challenges, and solutions to address gaps and barriers for addressing hesitancy. 
And in collaboration with country teams, we led the development of tailored learning materials to help address hesitancy issues and build vaccine confidence capabilities and assets. We really wanted it to be a um, collaborative environment where countries came together and learned from each other because we understand and appreciate that the people experiencing these issues are the most informed and the most sort of able to um, share their learnings and people really valued um, that aspect of the learning network. I'm just gonna briefly touch on reasons for vaccine hesitancy. This, so this is based on the um, in-depth interviews and qualitative research that we did with the countries. Um, and a highlighted feature among all the 12 countries participating was around the safety of vaccines. This was really um, shown clearly in all of our results. Um, this included mistrust in new products and manufacturers as well. Um, this was around parental um, hesitancy around the side effects, so fever, crying, pain, the number of shots per visit. Um, another strong theme, and I think somebody already touched on this, was hesitancy among healthcare providers themselves. So often they are the greatest source of health information for people, but they're also shown to have vaccine hesitancy issues. Um, the political and religious motivations as well were seen to be a challenge for these countries, that um, if people had distrust in government or if they had distrust in sort of the motivations of people in power, then they, um, that was seen to be connected to their, their reasons for accepting or refusing vaccinations. Um, in terms of communication challenges, again, healthcare professionals were referred to as having um, an influence on vaccination decisions. Most of the 12 countries noted challenges in responding to anti-vaccination and misinformation spread on social media. And this has been a big part of our work now and is a focus going forward as well, is how people are receiving information online, who are the players in sort of social media, and um, you know, what, where, where these um, rumors gain traction and um, the misinformation that's spread as well. So we do a lot of work around that. Um, but these countries identified that as a really emerging issue and somewhere they needed a lot of support. Um, and also our work highlighted the need for more attention to understanding and addressing hesitancy at the community and social network level. Again, leading into social media, how um, we can often have echo chambers of people having the same hesitancy issues and kind of talking to each other and being reinforced in their ideas around the safeties of vaccine. Um, I'm now gonna highlight a few country examples because I think these are really important in terms of the themes we saw, but also from a cross-country perspective that vaccine hesitancy is context specific and the way that um, challenges are addressed are specific to um, the challenges faced. So first in Armenia, I'll talk about an HPV vaccination example. Um, so HPV is a relatively new vaccine that's been rolled out in many countries. It, in Armenia, it happened in 2017. Um, and then they track coverage rates of these vaccination programs. So in September of 2018, the coverage rate was only 4.5%, which is really minimal and a really you know, bad reflection on the, the rollout of HPV. Um, so they did a lot of work to see what was going on. Um, Anti-HPV vaccination campaigns fueled public concerns. Um, and this was even before that the HPV vaccination was introduced. So this kind of happened online. Um, and was fueled by social media, school teachers, and political parties. The government had implemented advocacy and social mobilization activities before implementation. They you know, did the good work of preparing the ground and doing social mobilization. However, this was not enough, so they had to be a little bit more proactive and responsive. Um, and the concerns about the safety of HPV was among teenage girls themselves, the people who were targeted for the vaccine, their parents and school teachers. These concerns included the vaccine causes infertility. Teenage girls are too young to receive the, vac the vaccine for HPV. Um, it's very new, so they were unsure of the effectiveness and safety of the vaccine. Mistrust in government and their motivations. And again, the role of healthcare providers who do not feel confident to address questions and to um, you know, promote it. And, oft and it was shown in Armenia that actually healthcare providers were in fact, discouraging people from taking um, and accepting the vaccine, which is hugely um, problematic for this. So the public distrust around HPV was really a big problem. Um, so they mounted a communications response to this. So they took all this information and they said, okay, what can we do now to um, build public trust? So their communication response was multi-pronged. 
Um, it included gaining support of stakeholders, so this was from international societies, professional associations, academic and non-governmental institutions. They held continuous educational events, trainings, workshops, consultation meetings, and symposiums. They had an awareness campaign using mass media, but with a focus on social media. They invited um, political figures and people that are, were sort of social influencers to come onto TV and receive the vaccine so that people could see that it was safe and that the people that they thought were um, against the vaccine actually accepted the vaccine themselves, which was seen to be really effective. Um, and they also aligned with other advocacy activities and involved religious authorities. I'll just briefly touch on two other ones. In Vietnam, um, they did a really strong media engagement. So they saw the influence of traditional media and journalists um, on public trust. So what had happened that kind of spurred on this um, work was an adverse event following immunization had occurred, but then misinformation was picked up in the media and spread across the country. So people were listening to reputed news um, sources and then people lost trust in vaccination programs because of that. So what they did is they um, hosted a workshop with journalists first to inform them about vaccines more generally and then giving them tools um, and language to specifically use when they were on air and when they were speaking to the public about the safety, um, the scientific evidence, and how they could communicate these things in the media. And then if an adverse event happened, how do they communicate that? How do they do sort of risk mitigation strategies? Um, and this was seen to be really effective, and they now have a really good relationship with journalists so that um, they can kind of go to them. And I think that's really important was that um, relationship building aspect that they engage in. And then finally, just briefly, Ghana, um, they um, convened a communication group to engage traditional media and to monitor social media's influence on the spread of um, misinformation. So this is particularly relevant in their case where they have two um, trials going on around the malaria vaccine and the Ebola vaccine. Um, and learning from a really um, bad experience with the Ebola vaccine rollout in Ghana, in terms of um, information being spread over WhatsApp in particular, they wanted to really um, engage social media. This is just a word cloud showing some of the um, topics that are discussed in social media about vaccines. So they are um, understanding that they need to better engage social media and they need to better engage public and um, influencers and in how um, these sort of media channels are relaying information. So I'm just going to sum up some of the learnings from this LNCT network. Um, vaccine hesitancy encompasses a wide variety of contextual, individual, community de determinants. Interventions need to be specific and adapted, as we saw with the three country case studies, that their challenges were unique and that they needed a unique response to that. People need timely, accurate, and easy to understand information. There is need to elevate accurate inform information sources and build community trust while combating misinformation. So that elevation of the good sources and then to sort of um, combat the misinformation that's being spread in other places as well is really important. It's important to be um, proactive and not just reactive with communication strategies. So how do you kind of lay good groundwork beforehand to gain public trust and to have channels of good communication? Um, and finally, communication is a two-way process. Effective communication is also about listening and engagement. So it's not just about providing information. It's really key to be listening and engaging. Again, the people who know, um, who are the most informed, who are on the ground, who are doing the work, they're the sort of most important sources of information. And we really need to be um, platforming that and listening and engaging with um, public. Um, given the complexity of vaccine hesitancy and how context-specific it is, varying across time, place, and vaccine, there is no silver bullet or single intervention to addressing hesitancy. Communication strategies should be carefully tailored according to the target population, their reasons for hesitancy, and be context specific. Um, it's key to identify susceptible populations, explore underlying reasons for non-vaccination, and address those reasons. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.